In this video, we're going to talk about something called administrative burdens. We've all seen or heard government officials announce policies or new initiatives. Typically, they might announce an increase in funding for something or a great new program that expands access to something. And from the perspective of the people, this is great. They will get access to government services or funding, whatever the case may be. Now, while the politicians might want to do this, there could be an electoral benefit. In terms of balancing their fiscal priorities, this could be a bad thing. If too many people use the policy, that's going to cost a lot of money. So there may be a desire to limit access to the program. That's an important question to ask. When we see new policy announcements and new program announcements from the government, we need to ask, are there any barriers or impediments in place that are preventing people or limiting access to the programs? For example, these could be financial barriers. It could cost money to use the program or a service. That's a way of restricting access to it. But there are others. For example, administrative barriers. It's possible that there are things called learning costs. It, people might not know about the program. It might not be widely publicized. It could be compliance costs like paperwork. And there could be things that are psychological costs. Maybe there's a negative perception associated with people that use a program. These three types of costs are known as administrative burdens. And these are types of burdens that are non-legislative, but they prevent people from accessing a program or a service. Let's look at each one. Learning costs. This is the cost of finding information. We probably experience trying to access government programs or services that it can sometimes be difficult to find out exactly what you need to do. You know, first of all, does the program even exist? There's cases where the government might not be widely publicizing a program, how do you apply? Do you have to apply in person or is it online? Where to apply? Do you have to go somewhere? Do you have to go to a consulate or an embassy or a service office? How is it that you go about applying for this? And then what about meeting the requirements? What is it you need to do? Who qualifies? All of these things are learning costs associated with the program. And there are cases where you might look for a program, you might search it, and it could be difficult to find. Maybe it's not prominent on the government website. These are all aspects of learning cost. A great example would be things like student financial aid, student loans. They aren't always widely publicized. People don't know whether they qualify or not. They don't know what the requirements are. And the applications can be kind of ambiguous, tough to figure out. Another type of cost related, compliance costs. This is the cost of following the rules. Following the rules to access the program and to maintain participation in the program. Things like paperwork and documentation. These are costly to fill out um, in terms of time, but also they could be stressful. It could require people to validate and make sure that their applications are accurate by providing things like birth certificates, even death certificates. Maybe you need to prove residency or employment status. All of those things incur a cost on the user. Maybe you need appointments or tests. Some welfare benefits in the United States require drug tests of the recipients. Insurance programs might need health checks. Maybe you need to visit a doctor. Well, that imposes a cost, not only financial, but a cost in time. Compliance costs are the cost of following the rules. There are also psychological costs associated with this. These are manifested in stress, stigmatization, or negative feelings from the program. Now, one of the things that's associated with this could be a loss of autonomy. Maybe if you're on a certain type of government benefit, you're not allowed to participate in the labor market. If you're un taking unemployment insurance, maybe you can't work part-time beyond a certain level. There could be a negative perception associated with using the program. Maybe a stigma of being on welfare or being on go government benefits, and people might not want to be associated with that. That'll be a source of stress for the user. One example is in the United States, some benefit cards, supplemental nutrition assistance, also called food stamps. The way that program is administered creates a bit of a, a stigma. Most people, when they go shopping, will use a debit card or a credit card. However, benefit cards are a different color. They look conspicuous and they're restricted. You can't use them on some things. And so having to use that, having those feelings of alienation or stigmatization, imposes a psychological cost on the user. Now, how do these burdens get here? Well, typically, it could be uh, politicians or the institutions. Now, individual politicians, are they the ones 
putting on these burdens? It could be. That could be writing this into legislation, and it could be a function of ideology. Some politicians just might be resentful of people accessing government programs or services. It just might be antithetical to their ideology. They don't like the government doing things that uh, private companies could be doing. So there could be an ideological motivation for that on behalf of individual politicians. However, I'm tempted to try and blame the process, not always the people. It could just be a relic of the way institutions function. For example, in some institutional arrangements, the legislators will pass a law, but actually drafting the regulations and implementing those regulations are left up to administrators, people that work in the executive part of the government. That's called a delegation doctrine, where the legislature is delegating the implementing to the people that actually work for the different parts of the government. In that process, those are the folks that could be applying those administrative burdens. It's also possible in federal systems where there's a difference in priorities between the national and subnational units. Consider countries like Canada or the United States. The national government might be controlled by one political party. They might have a given priority. They ask the provinces or states to do something, whereas their political priorities might differ. They might not want to do that. So if the national government says expand access to health care, the provinces or states might be forced to do that, yet they can impose some administrative burdens to try and reduce people from accessing the program. If you're interested in administrative burdens, typically this is in the realm of public administration research, but there are some political scientists that do research like this, Carolyn Barnes, Don Moynihan and Pamela Hurd are three scholars that do some great work in administrative burdens, and they're really accessible and easy to read. Just to recap, administrative burdens, these are barriers or costs to accessing the government programs or services. These impose learning, compliance, or psychological costs on the users. These are often intentional. These are by design to prevent people from accessing the programs or at least reducing access to them. That is the ultimate goal.